Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Village Global's Venture Stories. I'm here today joined by a very special returning guest, Noah Smith. Noah, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, good to be back. So Noah, we're here today to talk about universities, the state of the universities. You've had a, uh, a recent tweet storm, uh, that I got got some good, uh, good play as well as a a, a blog post where you had a debate with Tyler Cowen. Let's lay out your thesis uh, for why universities are in a really tough place and have been in a tough place before COVID. Uh, and then let's get into, you know, why COVID has just accelerated it. Right. Well, so universities aren't, uh, for profit businesses. I mean, mostly and the ones that are bad, but they, but they still need money. And where do they get the money? So they can get it from state funding. They can get it from, um, tuition or they can get it from alumni. So state funding is in a real bad place during and after the great recession. State funding was cut dramatically and it never really rebounded. So state funding to this day, even before COVID was about 25% down from where it was in like 2007. So where did universities find the money? Tuition had been increasing for a long time, but American students really were not able to continue to pay ever higher prices. Um, they'd go in state, they'd, or they just wouldn't, wouldn't pay and, or couldn't pay. I mean, it was just too, too much. So instead they got foreign students and foreign students really plugged the gap because a lot of people from China, from India and from a, you know, a number of other places were willing to shell out big bucks for a university degree from America. That started to decline with Trump. Uh, people sort of heard Trump's rhetoric, uh, you know, xenophobic rhetoric. And uh, Trump also sort of made it harder for foreign students to get in. And that may, started a gentle decline in the number of foreign students, which started putting pressure on universities' finances. But then what really did it was COVID. Obviously, people can't come into the country um, easily. And, um, you know, mobility is completely screwed. And Trump has been making more moves against foreign students. And they expect foreign students... Uh, populations to drop by as much as 90% uh, this next year. And that's going to put a gigantic hole in university finances. Finally, COVID itself is hurting tuition more um, because it's basically, it's going to keep people away. You know, some people are just going to take a gap year instead of pay for a year of Zoom university, right? Because, um, and, but even if they let people back on campus, it's a giant COVID risk. I mean, dorms are a huge risk, parties, classes too, but really dorms and parties much more. And, uh, and student activities. And so that's going to be, and, and, you know, when people start getting COVID, the students are just going to get yanked. It's going to be a big fiasco. Colleges that don't see this coming are going to be in big trouble. Colleges that do see this coming are not going to have the students for the fall. And so, uh, and you know, of course the economy is going to be bad for a while now. And so people are going to go in state. They're going to save money. So basically on every front, except for possibly alumni donations, but on every front, universities are just really hurting for money and there's no obvious end to this pain in sight. And you already seen an accelerated pace of university closures before COVID. You saw like most of the for-profit universities were closing and private liberal arts colleges, these little sort of elite colleges, mostly in the Northeast, had been closing at a high rate. And uh, a few lower level state schools were starting to close, but we hadn't really seen pressure on them yet. I think we could see more pressure on them now. Um, So I think this is going to accelerate. Universities are going to close programs, reduce hiring you know, replace more faculty with, with low paid adjuncts and just do whatever they can to cut costs to try to stay afloat. And a lot of universities are going to go out of business. Yeah. And so that, that's what you expect to play out a year from now. Let's say we're having the same conversation or sort of an update. What do you expect to have happened? I expect we're going to see a lot like a, an accelerated pace of university closures, especially among those vulnerable liberal arts colleges and, and smaller colleges. I think we're going to see uh, big universities almost all cut back on, on programs. We're going to see things like MBA programs cut, uh, whatever's, you know, expensive. We're going to see, uh, you know, student residency, student life programs cut. We're going to see more, you know, faculty replaced with adjuncts, faculty not getting tenure, hiring freezes, things like that. I don't know if we're going to see any big university closures by next year in terms of state universities. And certainly the elite universities like Harvard or whatever, they're going to survive you know, that there's going to be demand for their product still. And they have big endowments, you know, to ride out any storm too. Um, but state schools I'm worried about, I'm worried about like the lower rank, lower rank state schools, like, you know, Cal state system is a great engine of upward mobility. It's some of the best 
in, in terms of boosting upward mobility, it's those are some of the best schools that exist, better than Harvard, certainly. You know, you go to like a lot of working class people go there. It's like their first the first person in their family to go to college and then like they get a boost to the middle class. That's going to be really stressed. And so I'm, I'm looking at that. I don't know if any of those are going to close in a year, but I think they're going to have to cut back on a lot of things. And I think we're going to see like a lot of private schools close. Yeah. I, I heard one argument that people say that Republicans are going to try to strip universities of all four areas of federal funding, tax exemption on the operating level, tax exemption on the endowment level, federal funding of research and federal subsidies for student loans. Is right. there a point? How do you think it, see that playing out? So, I mean, I expect them to try all those things. Uh, so before there was, there was a mostly bipartisan consensus that universities were good up until around 2014. So if you looked in 2012, Republican, you know, something like 60 something percent of Republicans and 70 something percent of Democrats would say universities have an overall good effect on society, blah, blah, blah. Then, uh, this really started to change. Democrats continued to be positive, but Republicans started to grow strongly negative. And there became this idea that universities were sort of engines of leftist indoctrination. And so, uh, like Republicans basically started deciding that universities were sort of like churches for, for liberal ideology and decided, and, and turned against them. And so that's, of course, Republicans are going to try to defund them if they can. Um, just like you've seen some Democrats talk about taxing churches, a uh, similar kind of idea. Is that idea right? Are universities engines of leftist indoctrination? I have serious doubts that that's actually true, uh, but it seems true to Republicans and that's what matters. So I, I do expect them to kind of try to attack. Yeah. What do you think about Jonathan Haidt's sort of critique of the university in that Putting aside left to right, although he does say, I think that the left, it used to be six to one, left to right, now it's like 30 to one. So it has accelerated. Maybe it's not, you know, a hundred percent. But what is, um, what do you say to his broader viewpoint or critique that instead of prioritizing the pursuit of knowledge above all, it sort of prioritizes a certain form of activism and that universities have to decide? What, what it's hard to say. I mean, I left the university world in like 2015. And at that time, I had never seen any of that, even a tiny, tiny bit. I hear stories of that. And, you know, people claim that things have changed since 2015 and that I can't rule that out. You know, you hear anecdotes about these things, but it's hard to say. So what I, the things I do know were number one, most professors are politically liberal. Some are like leftists, some not, but most are liberal. And one, you know, there's a number of reasons for that. One is like, if you're a liberal, do you really want to go work for a company? Like if you think, com or a leftist, especially like, do you want to work for a company? If you are working for a university and the government is paying your paycheck, do you really want to be for a, a you know, political party that wants to cut your, <laughs> cut your budgets on principle, you know, small government, you're getting paid by the government. Like, so there's, you know, there, there's these sort of things. And also we've been seeing this polarizing shift in America where educated people in general, have been turning, going to the left, um, college educated people in general. And of course, you know, um, the more years of education you get, the more there's been this bifurcation where like, you know, postgraduates have gone even more strongly to the left. So if you're talking about professors, you're definitely talking about people with tons and tons of education. So they're going to be more likely to be on the left. Yeah. Um, the question is indoctrination. Like is, are people getting like ideology from their classes? And here I really doubt because I've seen a number of studies that say, uh, people don't really pick up ideology from their classes. I mean, you have, you always have that like one person who's like, I learned so much from my women's studies professor and now I'm radical feminist and stuff like that. But, but to be honest, I doubt even those stories. I think those people took those classes because they had wanted to get into that stuff. And then that's the, the classes provided that. But I really think that ideology comes from other places. But like I, I can't think of a single teacher that's had any impact on my own ideology. Um, and I think that also people tend to react against authority figures as much as they react toward them. And I think you see a, every story I've heard of, uh, lefties trying to cancel professors goes the same way. It's always a professor who's very lefty being canceled by students who are also very lefty. And you could say, well, the, you know, what the, the lefty professors indoctrinated them and then they created a monster that turned on them or something like that. But I don't think that's what it is. I think it's that you have a bunch of lefty people because it's just a lefty, a place where lefties go and the students resent authority and want to cancel their professors. 
and the I- ideology is no shield for professors. The, the, you know, the, the radical feminist professor is the one at greatest risk of attack and cancellation by lefty students. And that, I think, points directly away from indoctrination as uh, the, the indoctrination thesis. But a lot of these older Republicans are people who didn't really go to college or they went, you know, to, I don't know, like they, they didn't, they certainly didn't go to like the, the kind of colleges that are very lefty. And so they think, they imagine that there's this indoctrination happening in these uh, schools. And I think they just don't really have a good idea of what's going on because when you zoom in, you see it's a bunch of like angry lefty students trying to like cancel angry lefty professors for any reason they can just out of like, you know, feeling their oats, wanting power, just getting mad about stuff and having no other, no other uh, target to take it out on except the nearby professor. Yeah. And, um, same with administrators too. Yeah. Do you buy sort of the broader concern that Matt TB or Andrew Sullivan or some of these other folks have around sort of one liberalism being under attack of left and the right? Um, just some of the, you know, free speech, et cetera, and, and, and under attack by sort of this, um, emergence of critical theory that was developed in, in the university or perhaps popularized in the universities and is spread out as people have graduated and, and taken it elsewhere. Maybe. I mean, so I've only read a little bit of critical theory and it was not fun. Um, critical theory is basically like, it's, it's very like abstruse POMO literary theory stuff. And like, I don't think anyone really gets it other than a, some extremely, extremely like out there people who just spend all their time thinking about it. And I don't think it really has clear messages. I mean, I don't like, you know, people talk about like Foucault. I think that the people who read Foucault don't come away from Foucault like radicalized. It's not like Marx where it's like, Marx opened my eyes to class struggle. I'd, it's not like that. Critical theory is just some of the goofiest, most abstruse, like up in your own head kind of thing. I'm sure that like medieval Jews in, in, in like a yeshiva in like Lithuania or something would have loved that critical theory stuff, but I don't really see it as ideological. I think that there are there's ideology out there, but I think that critical theory sort of takes that ideological fervor and turns it toward very inward facing, uh, and utterly, uh, ultimately, um, kind of benign and useless <laughs> pursuits. Whereas, um, when you see real ideology at work in the world, it's always really, really simple ideas. And it's always really, really simple stuff. And when you see people attacking liberalism, you I, I never see like critical theory as sort of a, a stick that people use to beat liberalism. I do think liberalism is under massive attack, but I don't think it's from Pomo head ass. So who's attacking it? Theory, you know? What's it under attack from then? Oh, well, it's under attack from a number of things. I mean, it's under attack from the internet. So like, you know, the people who made the internet were, were sort of idealistic hippies, you know, a combination of techno libertarians and techno lefties who all wanted to give the voiceless a voice. And that was the idea. Give the voiceless a voice. Well, guess what the voiceless are going to say? (laughs) They're going to say, fuck you. (laughs) Because that's what they've been wanting to say for a very long time. Yeah. Um, And so people meet and there's no gatekeepers. You know, you used to have all these like, you know, sort of the Dan Rathers of the world and like the Joe Kleins and the, I don't know, William Salatans and all these people you know, who were sort of like these gatekeepers who would challenge you, you know, who would channel ideas through this like filter of like acceptable elitist discourse. And when you bust that up, you're going to have like now the person with the microphone is anyone who feels like it is like any 14 year old who just read like France Fanon or just decided that like, you know, they're like a, um, a decolonial revolutionary with like a million flags and an anime avatar. Like that is the person with the biggest podium and the biggest megaphone now. Like yeah. a person who, who tweets that stuff and, you know, will get many times more people seeing their message than anything you've ever said in your life or I've ever said in my life, you know, and we're like sort of big yeah. mainstream media or like old line media kind of people. But the, you know, just viral tweets, that's where it comes from. It comes from, you know, it, live journal and Tumblr were the biggest, that was where wokeness began. It didn't yeah. begin in universities. It began on the internet. Like there were people with all these ideas and then they met each other and they just sort of egged each other on. And that's how that began. And like alt-right stuff 
that certainly didn't begin in universities. That obviously that did not need any university indoctrination. Like there were a couple Nazi professors in the world, but like, no, it didn't come from indoctrination. It came from just people meeting on 4chan and being like, you know, I hate Jews or like whatever, or like, yeah. you know, why aren't women real women anymore? Whatever the bullshit they say, like they just met in those online spaces and just egged each other on and egged each other on and it coalesced. And what are the intellectual foundations uh, on the on the wokeness side of the left of sort of this internet of Tumblr. I never spent time on Tumblr or Live Journal. Like, where are they sort of they getting their, you know? That's a good question, and I don't know that I'm necessarily the expert on that. But I think that um, one place that they get it is uh, decolonial theory from the '60s and '70s. So um, people like Fanon, um, so that like Fanon's a big person, or just a lot of like '60s and '70s activists who were just very far out there for their time, but, you know, they didn't have the internet, so they gathered in these little sort of extremist circles. Sometimes they're part of terrorist groups. I mean, whatever, like Asada Shakur. Like, and so there were, there was, you know, the Black Liberation Army or like whoever, um, Eldridge Cleaver, who later became a Reagan Republican. <laughs> um, he's an interesting figure. It's, but all these, um, these like, um, Yuri Kochiyama, I don't know like a bunch of, of basically radicals from the mid century, from the decolonial period, uh, when it was basically like the world was emerging from the grip of European colonialism at that time. And, you know, there was like real communist revolution around the, the globe. Yeah. And so you had that. And that is, I think one place that it really comes from, um, in terms of other wokeness stuff. I mean, you had, you had like, you know, your, your, extreme feminism in like the seventies and yeah, some of those people got university jobs, but that's cause like they couldn't get any other jobs. <laughs> that was all they could do. Like a lot of those people actually became high school teachers. Yeah. Um, I have a, th- um, like there's a, uh, an old weatherman. One of the leaders of the weatherman is like a, a, like a high school, uh, history teacher in San Francisco. I just randomly found that out. It's, and wow. so like the, these people are around and that's where the intellectual foundation really comes from. Yeah. from decolonial theory and from like sort of radical feminism of the seventies. Totally. Going back to universities, another critique people have or another concern people have is the fact that they are removing the um, standardized tests, you know, SAT, right. the GRE in certain places, and that right. this is only expected to continue. And that this means that, um, or some people think that it means that universities will be a less, you know, less good filter of talent because these tests are equalizers relative to grades, but also that, there'll just be a lot more politics. How how do you think about the effects of of this and and do you expect it to continue to play out? I think that that's basically right. Um, Universities are in trouble for students. And so they're essentially lowering their criteria for admissions to find more paying customers in a time when they're losing paying customers. That is why universities are dropping SAT requirements and things like that. They're like, if you have money, we will take your money in the short run. That gets you some money in the long term. That will probably lose prestige. But in order for universities as a whole to lose out from this, I think there'll need to be some other sort of filter. So like there will need to be some other sort of way to tell like who has basic talent so that companies can like hire people. If companies are just lazy, they're like, we don't care what you do or what you like or whatever. We just want to hire like someone with a 1500 SAT score or something. They know that they can like they can they can just grab random like generic smart people that's kind of filter may emerge. And so in um, Japan university is essentially it's nicknamed moratorium and it's essentially just a pass through filter for, you know, what, uh, what's, what test scores you got. And the tests are a lot more rigorous. Well, no, I mean, now, now we have really rigorous testing in America. They're a lot more rigorous than just like the SAT. They're more comparable to like the SAT plus all the AP tests, plus all the SAT twos, et cetera, all together. Um, and, and it's different, but basically if you take all the tests and you're like a, you know, you go through all these tests to like prove you're smart, you get into a top school and then you get hired for whatever job you want, basically. Um, at least if you're a man and then, um, but during college, basically it's four years where you're expected to just like hook up and get married, though people don't anymore. So that doesn't work. So now there's really not a hell of a lot of reason to maintain college in Japan. So at some point they'll probably try to make it more educational, but then in the U S like, I'm not sure if, but, but it's really cheap. 
see it's really cheap in Japan. So I'm not sure if we can sustain the model of a high tuition summer camp because it's going to be summer camp. Like if you remove the, if you remove the filters and you remove like really rigorous educational stuff, like testing, making sure people learned all their stuff and can like actually do the physics or chemistry or whatever. Like if you remove that, you really end up with a four, an incredibly expensive four year enrichment summer camp. Yeah. And companies are going to stop hiring people based on just the fact that they went to camp. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, if, if colleges will increasingly rely on their alumni for donations, I wonder if mm. alumni views will then, you know, uh, influence uh, the universities in a, in a more meaningful way. And I, I presume they're more conservative than, than not. That's a good question. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, alumni, uh, occasionally take an active interest in things and often just give money because of sentiment. Yeah. Um, it's not clear that that will, what that will do, um, because it would have to be a sea change in the interaction between alumni and the schools. But I do think what will happen is that knowing that they have to rely more on alumni for contributions, a lot of schools will be more eager to let in rich people, which could make universities more classist. Harvard already has a huge percent reserved for legacy students, i.e. rich people. And so, like you could see other universities going this, going in the same direction and just hi, like getting rich people and, and not necessarily legacies either, but just like trying to figure out who has rich parents and yeah. thus who will, you know, sort of rise to riches in the oligarchic economy that is America and be rich in turn and get as many of those people. And then they'll reserve some large, like maybe, I don't know, 30, 40% for like rich people. And then the other people will be a randomly selected group of people who they think will be good interactives and companions or the rich people who are their real money makers. And so it's going to be this, you go to summer camp, you like get rich people, the rich people get laid and party and have the best four years of their life, this awesome summer camp. And then you try to get them forever after that to be like, give money to your former summer camp. Yeah. Rich people then once they leave, they'll get jobs because they're rich or they'll have businesses because they're rich or they'll have family wealth because they're rich or they're, whatever they're rich. And so like, the rich stay rich. And then um, uh, with lack of intergenerational mobility, you have an oligarchic sort of society. And then colleges are basically become summer camp for oligarchs. Yeah. And I see that becoming a thing. I think mm -hmm. we're moving in that direction already. How do we get out of it? <laughs> if, if you were sort of master of the universe, like how, how could we uh, change things or if you could wave a wand? So, the, the cold fact is that universities are not going to be able to continue their activities without a federal bailout. And once again, as with many things, we see that like spending a lot of federal money is going to be the only way forward. And that's true of an increasing number of things in America. And that's, that's dangerous because a politicians may not want to spend and B at some point we may run out of the ability to spend not soon. I mean, Interest rates are really low, but if we spend things on an ongoing basis and have the federal government take on more and more of the economy in terms of spending, doing things with like essentially permanent deficit spending, someday we'll face a reckoning. Maybe not today, not tomorrow, but we will someday. So that's, mm -hmm. that's another danger. And then, uh, but you know, that, that goes beyond universities, uh, but also politicians may not be willing to pay. You've got, you've got so many Republicans having decided erroneously, in my opinion, but having decided that colleges are these lefty indoctrination factories, they're going to, as long as Republicans have any power, they're going to block funding for lefty summer camp, what they perceive to be lefty summer camp, yeah. right? And they're going to block it. They shouldn't block it, but they're going to block it. And will we hope that like the blue wave is so big that Republicans will never come back ever? Or that, you know, demography is destiny and like the old people, old Republicans dying will mean like, Republican Party's dead forever and we'll never be able to block things again, kill the filibuster, pack the court, etc. I don't know. Maybe, who knows what the hell will happen with politics, but I think that the, the, the turn of Republicans against universities bodes ill. Yeah. Uh, unpack the, the disagreements, uh, the uh, disagreements that you, you have with Tyler over how you see the current situation and how you see the, the future uh, of university. Well, Tyler really, Tyler thinks that distance education is a big deal. He's put, he's sunk money and time into that. He really believes that college is about education. You can get the same education online. Therefore, college will be replaced by online. I deeply believe that that is wrong because college is a bundle. And I think you really put your finger on it the other day in some tweets where you discussed the, all the different things college provides. It provides personal growth. 
It provides networking. It provides mentoring. It provides all these things. One thing that you didn't even mention was lab experience. So if you have any sort of thing that depends on being in a lab, like chemistry, biology, materials science, anything like that, learning that requires you to be physically on site somewhere. You're, you're firmly in the realm of atoms there. And so that's not easily replicated. I mean, you can imagine some sort of like, you know, like labs that then like rent out their space to like education companies. So like you go to wherever the bio lab is, blah, blah, blah. But that's going to be hard to do. So what will you need to completely replicate the college experience? You will need dating apps and dating apps that are actually really good. Dating apps that mean like that most people can get a date, you know. And so some people like um, my friend Wes Yang, I don't know if you know him. He says like, a few surplus guys males. get all the dates. Surplus males. Surplus males. And so like, you know, a few guys getting all the dates is fine in college because like they're, they're you know, like everybody, ha everybody sort of winds up as somebody mostly, but then like in, in dating apps, it's possible to like not. And so you have to have dating apps that don't do that, that actually work for people. And I think most women that I know who are dating apps also don't like them. They don't enjoy them and dating apps aren't that great yet. It's a technology that's not mature. And, but the, but the thing is that like, when we think about what's necessary for social change in the past, things that involve sex and romance, we've mostly swept those under the rug, refused to talk about them, taboo, tee hee hee sex, right? But now I think if you're really thinking about how to replace college and how to give people a good life, you can't shy away from that. You got to think, how are people going to hook up and have romance? It's an incredibly mm. important part of life. Like I, and so the question is, if you don't do it in college, like if you don't have hooking up in romance you've got to have some other way to do it like you know in like at age 19 how can a 19 year old hook up and have yeah. romance if not for just like going to parties with friends in physical meat space right how can i don't think any apps have really addressed that yet elitist networking is certainly a part of college and we don't like to talk about it because it's elitist but then how do you have elitist networking i think Ironically, you've had elitist dating apps. Like, what's the one that will only like show you like IV people? The league. The league. Yes. The league, which is, <laughs> I remember two of my friends, like one of my friends matched with another one of my friends on the league and then finding out that like they had a real world friend connection was actually too embarrassed to go out with them. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, but yeah, so the league, but like, ironically, you have elitist dating apps, but elitist networking apps you'll need to have. Like, yeah. how do you, right now, uh, you know, like I go to Stanford, someone else goes to Stanford and we're like, hey, we're both Stanford people, let's network, right? How do you replicate that with apps? How do you replicate late night dorm conversations? I think now, finally, with a combination of Twitter and Zoom, so Twitter is like late night annoying dorm, dorm room arguments that go nowhere. <laughs> Twitter has replicated this part of college. It's done. We've done it. But like the, the actual, you know, like getting to know you sort of like talk about our lives kind of conversations. I think Zoom is just now getting to the point where it can be that for people and people can actually like feel comfortable, like, you know, but, but the experience of college of like being a young person hanging around on like some, some like smelly old couches and someone's like, you know, like old, crumbling like house or apartment or something like that and smoking some weed and like talking about your you know talking about your feelings in a stupid 19 year old way it's incredibly important incredibly powerful valuable experience that everyone loves and yeah. if if apps are going to replicate that they've got to replicate that you can't just replicate chemistry homework you talk about the parts of bundling and it's always the social experience i get that does teaching and, and research need to be bundled and does uh you know, lib liberal arts and sort of career, uh, you know, boot campy stuff need, need to be bundled. Do you see unbundled on either of those dimensions unbundling possible? Hmm. So I don't know about the liberal arts. I don't really know. Um, because it may be that liberal arts, you know, teaches people like how to communicate because it makes you write. And there's been a lot of research showing that like writing and argumentation is one of the most important things you learn in any school, including high school, grade school, like whatever you, um, you need to write and argue and physics class does not teach you that you can learn it on blogs and Twitter and whatnot, but it's irregular. So the question is, can you teach people to like argue and talk? Because like, it's, that's really important to employers, right? You need to be able to communicate with your team. You need to be able to sell things like, you know, of course, in the, in the venture world, now it's becoming to the part where like essentially 
venture salesmanship and being able to communicate a vision, communicate an idea is becoming more prized, whereas just being able to like hack stuff is becoming more commoditized. Right. You'd say everyone tells me that's true. Yeah, so. totally. Yeah. And so, so that speaks to the increasing importance of liberal arts type stuff. My sense is that you can unbundle it, but it'll, employers will eventually want to know you can do both. Yeah. They will, they'll want to see you can like write and talk and argue somehow. Yeah. And not just code or, or do math or whatnot or do lab stuff. And yeah. like, yeah. So I think that's a thing. Um, what was the other, oh, uh, teaching and research. Yeah. Do you know enough about sort of the history of the university to understand or to know, I don't, how they got merged together mm -hmm. or just how the purpose of the university has evolved over time? Yeah. So it was Germany. So originally universities were sort of like schools for the, for like talking shops, liberal arts education for elite people. So like get elite people to know each other and argue and blah, 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 blah. And that was the British uh, model at that time. And then Germany came along and, and, and so for Britain, like research was done other, you know, like, in other ways, like research was done by sort of independent inventors um, who were sometimes patronized. Germany was like, no, we're going to do this systematically. We're going to have the researchers teach the next generation of people so they know how to do research too. So we're going to have the people who do the research also be the teachers. So Germany, of course, is always focused on apprenticeship, like German, Germans love apprenticeship. And so te merging teaching and research became a sort of apprenticeship thing. And that's still true in grad school in America. For undergrads, it's true for only a few people. There are a few people who learn how to do research in undergrad. Most do not. Although that may be changing now. It may be going back toward more people doing that because kids are getting more precocious, I guess. But Or there's just higher demands. I don't know. But when I was in school, you know, early 2000s, like I did a lot of, of, of undergrad research, but not many people did. It was relatively rare. I think it might be getting more common. I don't know. But for grad school, it's universal. That's just what you do. So, but as special as technological specialization has increased, people like, you know, grad school is now like the cutting edge, whereas undergrad, you don't get to the cutting edge in four years. And that's a shame, but I don't know what to do about that. Um, as for bundling teaching and research, a lot of teaching can be done by career lectures. Adjuncts are typically like not very good um, because they're part time. Their experience levels very widely. They're not well paid. Highly paid lecturers who just learn the material, like basically like imagine high school teachers, but like really good, like the best high school teachers that you know, that's like that's like a really good university lecture. I think that that you can use that for a lot of stuff. It's good for researchers to teach some classes because it puts them back in touch with the fundamentals. I'm curious why there hasn't been. Sufficient competition at the university. Obviously, it's hard to you know create a university that has strong network effects. But I think the you know Stanford was like over 100 years ago. We, we you know we see new <laughs> social media platforms like every 20 years or new tech platforms. Why has it been so hard to 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 really have you know uh, definitive uh, com competitors? I, I'm even surprised we don't see like companies create like Walmart University or Facebook University. Like if they you know searching for talents, that could be such an interesting you know sort of way to do it. W what do you think about sort of competitiveness within universities why would anyone make a new elite university good business no if, if it works <laughs> is it's not a good business stanford Harvard. No, it's terrible business all uh, the best universities are non-profit uh, leland stanford didn't make any money off <laughs> leland stanford junior university he made all his money like building railroads and exploiting the workers like he was going to donate all his money to harvard but they kept him waiting in the waiting room too long or so the legend goes <laughs> so who, who makes all that money on the endowment i mean that's a lot of money what do you mean who makes all the money? It's a nonprofit. It goes to, I mean, like salaries, but university administrators are not that highly paid. It hire, it goes to hiring a larger number of administrators. Well, could you imagine a university that, a private university that was focused on like ISAs or something, you know, as a different business model? What's ISAs? With, uh, income share agreements, sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you can, but the problem is that every attempt to have a for-profit private university has failed. You can have things like Lambda School, you know, that like has education for like a specific purpose but all like for-profit universities have were a giant bust like it's important to understand how much of a bust they were they all went bust before covid people took out all this debt they charged massive tuition their job results were terrible their placement records were terrible people went into all this debt and they and people stopped going and they collapsed they were massive debacle and it speaks to the question of why would you why would you make a prestigious university? Because there's so few ways that you can capture the value of what you 
create. With education, you're buying something that you whose quality you cannot assess until after you've bought it. So if you're the first round of customers, you can't assess the quality until decades after you buy the thing. And then the next round of customers can't assess it. And so the very first assessments you get come in a decade, more than a decade, more like two decades after you start the thing. And guess what? There's a bunch of scams. They collapsed. Next time, what will happen? The same thing. I think one sort of analogy in adjacent space, I mean, some people say Y Combinator has done this a little bit and use venture capital as a way to, they certainly try to model themselves after university. Right. Um, oh, no, absolutely. I think what you're seeing with things like Lambda School or Y Combinator are for-profit trade schools. And that can be, a, I think that has a little better effect because you can get results really fast. So Y Combinator alums can get funded really fast. People in like, um, oh, what's the data science thing? Like uh, Insight? Yeah. Uh, they, they can get job placement really fast. And so you can get these results really fast because you're in this limited field and all you care about is like the immediate placement right after school. Universities are more about like your whole career trajectory and stuff like that. But all the people going to all these schools with a very few exceptions, there are a few exceptions of like the Teal Fellows or whatever. All the people going to these schools have been to college. (laughs) They went through college and then they did Lambda School and then they did, they, you know, like my friend did Insight and she was a professor. And then she did it like you've already got your all your background, all your basic education, all your like personal growth. Like, you know, you're not like Lambda School is unlikely to like introduce you to like the love of your life or something like that. Is there a legacy to Peter Thiel's sort of, uh, you know, uh, entry into into uh, education or or is there a place you strongly disagree with him and sort of his critiques of of higher education? I don't know Thiel's critiques as much. Are they different than the other stuff you've been tossing out or? He basically says it's a it's a church where it, less so in the leftist stuff, although probably that too, but more so in that we think we need it for salvation. Um, it's it's sort of this night nightclub that restricts access. Um, when it you know if, if it was really positive, some or the, good for the world, it would expand. Access, you know, it, you'd open it up to more people, and it's this weird you know hybrid between a, a social nightclub that that gets its power from exclusivity and sort of this vague insurance uh, policy, but. We don't really have enough counterfactuals to determine uh, how causal it is versus just, cor- you know, correlated because it's the thing that, that people do. I mean, I think that's just another way of describing how it's bundled, how describing the bundle. It's this amazingly big bundle of important things. College sells a thing that we don't have a word for in English, but we have a word for it in Japanese, which is called seishun, which is this, uh, it means blue spring. In Japanese, it means the time when you sort of turn into a young adult. It's the best time in your life because you're just starting to become a person. Yeah. And, you know, like Japanese movies and whatever will have like, you know, like, like there'll be lots of seishun movies. And if you're a certain age in Japan, you can buy these tickets that allow you to ride any train in the country for like several weeks because you're supposed to just ride trains around the country and like, grow up and you know have an adventure like that's a thing you're supposed to do so it's it's uh it's ticket 18 you know because you're supposed to be 18 when you do it and uh and i i did it when i was 24 i think that was the last year i could do it when i was living in japan but i i did that i traveled around japan for like three weeks on this ticket it's a thing where so what do you do at college you meet people from a whole bunch of backgrounds and walks of life that you wouldn't have known in your hometown and that you wouldn't have known you needed to find and know and that you might not have, you know, like met any other way uh, because we still don't have good social discovery tools, even Twitter or whatever. Like you meet a bunch of new different people, right? Even better than the army. You live on your own. That's cool. You can drink alcohol illegally or smoke weed or hook up or whatever you want to do. You have romance, which is, I would say that that is the number one priority for an absolute majority of people between the ages of 18 and 22 is romance. I would say that the people who care about money, you know, social status, getting an education, learning physics, coding some cool app, you know, whatever, all of this, like romance is number one. And, you know, maybe yeah. friends number two, but like, and, and in terms of romance, it's not just sex. Like people think about college kids as like just hooking up and having a bunch of casual sex. And there's, there's some people who do that. But I think that 
almost everyone in college is looking for like romance, whether or not they find it. I think that a lot of this hookup culture ends up being people who are just really bad at connecting with each other and really bad at actually finding the romance that they want. Um, but it's, but it's incredibly important and college sells the promise of romance and no dating app or something has done that anywhere as effectively as college. It, so you meet new people, you meet all, and you make like all these really good friends living on your own. And this is just the social stuff. I haven't even gotten to like the business stuff, the money making stuff, the other stuff, but like you get exposed to, you know, you, you get exposed to new perspectives. So when I was in college, I never once thought that I'd want to study economics. It never crossed my mind. But then I met a guy named uh, Ben Eifert. He's uh, he's on Twitter now. He's a hedge fund guy now. But then he studied economics and he sort of got me interested in it. And there I was. That changed the course of my life, right? Like I never even thought about that before. I think that's a perfect place to to, to wrap. I'm going to include uh, your, your tweet storm, the the Bloomberg uh, in, in the show notes. Uh, no, uh, uh, any uh, sort of, wrap on a bow or, or last words on the, on the topic that you want to uh, get across? Well, first of all, didn't your podcast used to be three hours long? I was like prepared. <laughs> oh, uh, well, I've, uh, I've, uh, back by popular demand. I've, uh, I've tried to shorten it to 45 minutes. Or, <laughs> or fair, enough, fair enough. It was, it was a marathon before. Um, America is going through a period of unrest and chaos. You read about that happening to other countries and you're like, wow, that's wild. And it happens to every country. It's happened to us before at other times. It's happening again now. And um, when we get out on the other side of this, a lot of things may look different. The status quo that we all grew up with was the result of an equilibrium of economic and social and cultural forces and political forces that will be disrupted by the current chaos and will recoalesce, fall back into some new configuration. And so it's an exciting time. You know, think about what new things could be created, what new institutions, like if you want, if you really want to unbundle college and you want to replace college, imagine something better than college. Imagine it and then make it. But if you imagine something like cheaper and worse than college, people may take it, but they won't like it. My request for startups in this space is Hogwarts. <laughs> yes, Hogwarts. Yeah. Uh, right. And on the app store, you need Hogwarts, the app. <laughs> yes, that's what I think about. Uh, no, thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast. I'll have to have you back uh, again soon. Uh, I, I, I appreciate it. It was a fantastic episode. Thanks. All right. It was really fun. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Check us out at villageglobal.vc.